Buying or selling sex is illegal in South Korea. The impact is clear. The freewheeling red light districts that once dotted many of South Korea's major cities have been mostly tamed. Many of those brothels that once operated in those districts have been forced out of business. Those that remain face the threat of police raids. While most brothels in South Korea have closed since the introduction of a new sex trade law a decade ago, some still remain. But despite the law's success in red light zones, the country's sex trade continues to flourish underground, say people who follow the industry. Many other girls who used to work here have left for the massage parlors or cheap hotels that are known as places where sex is bought and sold in more discreet ways than the red light districts of old. In order to skirt police crackdowns, prostitution these days is more commonly found in places such as hotels that turn a blind eye to the sex trade and in back rooms of otherwise legitimate businesses like massage parlors and bars, according to people who monitor the industry. In another sign of the times, initial transactions between workers and clients often take place online, they say, further complicating authorities' efforts to track them. Police say that enforcing the sex trade law has become more difficult as prostitution has dispersed from the red light districts and officers lack the resources they need to broaden their crackdown. About 270,000 Korean women worked in prostitution, or 3.5% of all women in their 20s and 30s, according to a 2007 report into the industry by the government's Ministry of Gender Equality and Family. The size of the sex industry, both from openly operating brothels and underground businesses, was estimated at 14 trillion won, or 12.7 billion U.S. There's little debate in South Korea that prostitution is still widespread. In a high-profile media report in 2012, a major national newspaper reported that it was able to find more than 100 bars and salons in one kilometer radiuses of the center of the cities of Seoul, Busan, Wilson, and Gwangju that sold sex. During and following the Korean War, the United States military used regulated prostitution services in South Korean military camp towns. Despite prostitution being illegal since 1948, women in South Korea were the fundamental source of sexual services for the U.S. military and a component of Korean-American relations. The women in South Korea who served as prostitutes are known as Kijichon, women also called as Korean military comfort women, and were visited by the U.S. military, Korean soldiers, and Korean civilians. The prostitutes were from Korea, Philippines, China, Vietnam, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Indonesia, and the Commonwealth of Independent States, specifically Russia, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine. Beginning in 1945, an institutionalized system of prostitution was adopted and permitted by the U.S. military and the Republic of Korea. Despite the United States forces Korea's policy stating, Hiring prostitutes is incompatible with our military core values. There is a discrepancy between practice and policy. In Korean society, prostitution is viewed as a necessary evil. The U.S. military have explained it as military culture that allows for the American GIs to blow off steam and prevent homosexual tendencies. Prostitution for U.S. soldiers were esteemed to be at the bottom of the social hierarchy by South Koreans. They were also the lowest status within the hierarchy of prostitution. In 1953, the total number of prostitutes throughout the population of South Korea was 350,000, according to one government report. Surveys carried out in the 1950s and 1960s suggest 60% of these prostitutes worked near U.S. military camps. But although these prostitutes worked near U.S. military camps, many of them served only Korean men. A 1984 report suggested that the number of prostitutes around U.S. bases had dropped to less than a third of the total number of prostitutes in the country. Park Chung-hee, who ruled South Korea during the 60s and 70s, and the father of the former president Park Gun hai encouraged the sex industry in order to generate revenue, particularly from the U.S. military. Park seized power in the May 16 coup and immediately enforced two core laws. The first was the Prostitution Prevention Law, which excluded camp towns from the governmental crackdown on prostitution. The second was the Tourism Promotion Law, which designated camp towns as special tourism districts.
During the 60s, prostitution and other related businesses generated nearly 25% of the South Korean gross national product. In 1962, 20,000 comfort women were registered. The prostitutes attended classes sponsored by their government in English and etiquette to help them sell more effectively. They were praised as dollar-earning patriots or true patriots by the South Korean government. In the 1970s, one junior high school teacher told his students that the prostitutes who sell their bodies to the U.S. military are true patriots. Their dollars earned greatly contribute to our national economy. Don't talk behind their back that they are Western princesses or United Nations madams. For anyone even casually versed in the long-standing U.S.-Korean alliance, this visual juxtaposition of state power and casual sexual predation pulls you up short. It's like a silent scream against U.S. military power and sexual domination. Lots of people are ashamed of what happened in the camp towns and want to forget. The U.S.-South Korean alliance depended on these comfort women. Militarized prostitution and the subjugation of women around U.S. bases are but two of the darker features of the U.S. partnership with South Korea that most Americans, especially after years of tension with North Korea, know of only haphazardly, if at all. While in the U.S. sphere of influence, the southern half of this divided country has lived through two bloody counterinsurgencies in 1948 and 1980, while enduring decades of U.S. backing for authoritarian governments. Yet, outside of places like Dongdushan, where activists and artists have memorialized the struggles of South Korean camp town women, their searing and sometimes violent experiences in the industry are a distant memory, much like the Korean War itself. This is, after all, a youthful, male-dominated society with a strong nationalist streak.